Welcome to COVID's Lasting Impact, Caring for Immigrant, Migrant, and Asylee Patients, a 10-episode mini-series within Migrant Clinician Network's On The Move podcast, a podcast dedicated to providers who work with vulnerable populations, specifically migrant populations. In this mini-series, MCM provides clinical teams, including community health care workers and primary care clinicians, with up-to-date information, expert guidance, resources, and relatable case stories for identifying, treating, and managing COVID and long COVID among U.S.-based immigrant, migrant, asylee, and limited English proficient patients in the outpatient setting. MCN is a national nonprofit with extensive experience providing timely, practical solutions at the intersection of vulnerability, migration, and health. Each episode provides clinicians with impactful tools and information for improving the quality of COVID care for vulnerable populations. If you want to hear future conversations on the topic of health justice, be sure to subscribe to the On The Move podcast. For resources mentioned in today's podcast, be sure to click on the link in our episode notes to go to our podcast page at migrantclinician.org backslash podcasts. Welcome to today's podcast. It's titled COVID Care After the COVID-19 Public Health Emergency, Vaccines, Testing, and Treatment. I'm Dr. Ed Zerwesti. I'm the founding medical director of the Migrant Clinicians Network. And today I am very delighted to have my friend and colleague, Esther Rojas, with me. Uh, She's the project coordinator at, at the Migrant Clinicians Network, who's been heavily involved in our work with COVID. We'll be discussing changes in COVID care after the end of the public health emergency and important guidance on vaccines and care access that clinicians should be aware of. Esther Rojas works as MCN's project coordinator in the Eastern Region office. She received her BS in public health from Salisbury University and a certificate in community based participatory research from the University of Michigan in 2021. As the project coordinator, her work has included the coordination and management of various COVID-19 projects focused on increasing vaccine awareness in migrant and vulnerable populations in the United States and Puerto Rico. Since March of 2022, Rojas has worked closely with community-based organizations to provide technical assistance and capacity building to community health workers serving Latina, Latino, and Haitian communities in her state. Welcome, Esther. Hi, Dr. Ed. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me. On a personal note, I, I've worked a lot with Esther. Uh, we've done a lot of webcasts together. We've done a lot of learning collaborative sessions together. And Esther's really been the one who's been working day-to-day on the front lines with community health workers and providers uh, who were doing the the work of vaccinating uh, individuals for COVID and educating them about COVID. Um, so Esther, why don't you just kind of give us a, a snapshot of a day in the life of Esther over the last year or two working on COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like you said, it was it was a lot of that um, capacity building, a lot of that technical assistance for our community health workers, and also for the community based organizations that they work for. Um, so in my day to day, I I am able to coordinate a lot of the efforts, not just with uh, Dr. Ed here, um, but also with our. Um, a lot of our teams, project managers. Um, and what M- MCN has essentially done is break down the science for a lot of our community health workers and community-based organizations. Um, so these health agencies like CDC, we're putting out suggestions, recommendations, and policies about COVID-19. And we were able to take that, break it down um, for the everyday individual and also for our migrant, immigrant and refugee communities um, in a way that made sense to them. Um, So my day-to-day includes some of that. And then I also am able to work uh, locally here uh, with the Lower Shore Vulnerable Populations Task Force, um, where we're addressing, again, COVID-19, but also taking that holistic approach and 
uh, identifying the barriers. So whether it's food, whether it's housing, education, and child care that might limit someone's access to COVID-19 vaccines or treatment, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place. Um, so my day-to-day -day is a little bit hard to define, but um, includes a lot, of, a lot of great work with a lot of great um, partners and contributors. Great, great. Well, we thought we'd start out this session with just a little bit of quick review. I'm just going to spend a few minutes on reviewing uh, COVID vaccines and I'm going to talk about why it's important to stay up to date with your vaccines, uh, the risk and benefits of vaccines. And I thought I'd start out with just, just a little historical background. You remember that the first case of COVID came in the United States in actually January of 2020. We didn't have our first death until about the end of February of 2020. And then amazingly, by December of 2020, less than a year after that first case came in, we had the first FDA approved vaccine. And that was a monovalent vaccine that was just for the Delta strain uh, of COVID that we had at that time. And then we had our first bivalent booster in September of 2022. And it was bivalent in that that one had not only the Delta, but also the, the Omicron strain. And then it uh, in April of this year, 2023, it was approved by the FDA and the CDC for certain high-risk populations to get a second bivalent booster. Um, and now it looks like in the fall of 2023, this year, we're probably going to have a, a monovalent Omicron only booster. And it looks like from both the FDA, the FDA met in uh, middle of June uh, and they approved having a monovalent. And so I think the most important thing is that people should stay up to date on their vaccines, especially if they're in those high risk groups of anyone over the age of 65 or anyone who's immunocompromised. Uh, those are the people who are most likely to get COVID and have bad uh, outcomes from COVID. The other thing that's important to remember about vaccines are that vaccines were developed not necessarily to prevent infection. They were developed to prevent the worst side effects of getting COVID infection, that of hospitalization and deaths. So it's been shown over and over again that the COVID vaccines have prevented tremendous amounts, probably 70 to 90% of hospitalization and deaths from COVID if a person is fully vaccinated. There is no such thing as a vaccination without side effects. There's always side effects. The most significant side effect from this vaccine, first of all, I have to say, these are the safest vaccines we've ever had in the world. They're extremely safe vaccines. The only this really significant side effect that we found was really the, the very rare myocarditis in adolescent males. That was probably the most significant side effect that came out of this whole COVID vaccine situation. And it must be pointed out that the actual myocarditis that you get from COVID is much more severe so I think I'm going to stop at that point at this point in time. That's kind of a little update on vaccines. And now I want to ask Esther a bunch of questions. So Esther, my first question to you is, can you explain why we need to continue to talk about COVID after the end of the public health emergency? And I'm, I'm going to lead with my biggest takeaway here. Um, COVID isn't over. The only thing that really ended was the way that our government um, is responding to COVID-19 by no longer providing that funding that we initially had. Um, so this also affects the way that we monitor um, and collect our data about COVID-19, um, but we are still seeing that deaths due to COVID and also infection rates um, are still occurring nationally. All right, my next question is, what services have ended now that the national public health emergency is over, and how will this impact immigrant, migrant, and refugee communities? So one of, one of the biggest changes that is coming about and 
probably one of the most obvious for many of us is that um, that funding is no longer there for the free vaccines, free tests, and also some of those treatments, which will uh, essentially impact the way that our communities, the migrant, immigrant, and refugee communities are able to pr uh, protect themselves, um, treat, and also care for their families and their households. Another aspect um, is the co um, continuous Medicaid re-enrollment, uh, which has been changing on a state-to-state -state basis, but um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, essentially the last three years, individuals were able to sign up one time for Medicaid um, benefits, and then that coverage would continue uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, and they wouldn't have to navigate this complex and confusing system that is our Medicaid program. Another aspect is a reduction in funding to community-based organizations and health agencies that are in, uh, aiming to increase the uh, COVID-19 vaccine um, in, in their communities and also our SNAP benefits, which um, many individuals know as food stamps, has reduced significantly for many individuals and also um, this affects the way that they're able to feed not only themselves, but also their children, which in in, in total, it, it will affect our communities as a whole. How could these communities still access health care coverage? Yeah. Um, so like I, I mentioned, the end of that continuous Medicaid re-enrollment, um, because it is ending, many individuals will now have to navigate that system, which is, again, can, it's very complex. Um, so the best way, the best thing that they can do and the best way that they can uh, continue to be informed is when they receive a notice about the end of their continuous enrollment, um, they can ensure that their um, contact information is up to date as possible and also uh, try to find any services which will provide language access um, and also any assistance when it comes to uh, computer access in order to re-enroll again. For our refugee individuals, um, they're able to access the refugee medical assistance for up to 12 months after they arrive into the country. Um, any individuals who are not um, uh, eligible for either of those, there's always employer health insurance, or they can uh, find health insurance through um, the health insurance marketplace, which, again, I, I don't feel like that is... Um, a sufficient answer for, for many individuals. Um, but we have our federally qualified health centers, which of course are a great avenue for individuals seeking vaccines, tests, and care in general. Um, for many individuals who are uninsured or underinsured, our health departments are also uh, a great access point for, for many of these treatments, um, not just COVID-19, but any other information. And for our community-based organizations, my recommendation would be to continue mapping out where are um, these these agencies or um, these free access points for many of our communities um, in order to fill those gaps. Yeah, and that's important. I, I think it's important that everybody knows that community health centers and public health clinics don't turn anyone away. And if they if they have problems, they will find a solution for those individuals. Well, there's a new federal program that, that I've just heard about very recently, and I want you to explain a little bit about the new Federal Health and Human Services Bridge Access Program for COVID-19 vaccines and treatment. We've been hearing a lot about that the last week or two. Yeah, um, so have I. I'm, I'm trying to learn about as much as I can. Um, and really what the administration, the current administration has said is that this bridge access program um, is gonna fill some of those gaps where the funding left off from the public health emergency. Uh, so I personally would say, I, I'm not sure what the rollout is gonna look like, so it, it might change. Um, but what we're hearing is that there's essentially gonna be three access points for individuals seeking free COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and this is uh, set to roll out in the fall of 2023, so quite soon now. Um, and the three access points will be, number one, our health departments, which um, the CDC denotes as the uh, local health agencies, um, and they will essentially take 
and distribute from the CDC these COVID-19 vaccines to their networks. Number two is going to be our federally qualified health centers. Like you said, they don't turn away anyone, regardless of their health coverage. And then lastly, our retail pharmacies, um, which is uh, incredible. Um, I think feat for for us to be able to say that our pharmacies are going to be partnered with us in uh, the fight against COVID-19. Um, but they're going to be covering for individuals who are also insured, but their insurance does not cover the whole cost of the COVID-19 vaccine. So right. a, a lot of unknowns, I would say. <laughs> right. Well, that's really great. The, the administration really understands that, especially in the fall when these new vaccines come out, that we're going to have to have access. And the real concern is last year also what we saw was because of all this anti-vaccine uh, dogma that's going on out there and misinformation, even the flu vaccine last year was not accepted as well as it had been in the past. So hopefully with the retail pharmacies, and, and they're oftentimes also trusted uh, partners in the communities, uh, for them to partner, I think will really be helpful. I would also add that um, we've also seen kind of the tide change with um, not just uh, our administration, but also with uh, the vaccine manufacturers. Um, and this is something that I should add. Um, Pfizer and Moderna have announced that they are also in this movement to provide free vaccines for individuals. Um, so what I think is going to happen is that there might be some interplay between what we know as the bridge access program through our federal government and also these large vaccine manufacturers to continue providing free vaccines once the vaccines go into the commercial market. So um, something else to keep an eye out for and, and hopefully we'll, we'll see a smooth transition. All right. Well, well, you just explained that you and I are having trouble keeping up with all this. So how can clinicians who are out there on the front line doing a lot of other things, very, very busy every day, how are those clinicians going to stay updated on the changes in access to COVID care for their patients? So I'm going to do a shameless plug for MCN because we have this amazing resource, um, which is available in both English and Spanish. Um, and that is our frequently asked questions blog, uh, COVID-19 migrant and immigrant food and farm worker patients, which, uh, like I said, is available in two languages. Um, and we are able to gather a lot of our latest questions, but also we have a lot of the basic questions and questions specific to our working communities, our migrant communities, um, a lot of great information for clinicians. And I will say that I use it personally. Sometimes there are questions that I need answered, and this is one of the best ways to have those questions answered. We're able to pull uh, questions and, and also comments from our local community partners and national partners in order to gather more information of what are we hearing on the ground. Um, and then also have uh, our amazing clinicians on staff like Dr. Ed and Dr. Laz, who are able to break down some of that science for us. Um, I will also mention that there are amazing videos that are tagged um, to those questions, which will also help uh, increase the reach of our, our amazing blog. So um, I believe our link to that is going to be added, but um, of, of course, always uh, check with the CDC websites, uh, check what the FDA, CDC are saying um, with any other um, additions to what's going on with COVID. I know everything changes so rapidly, um, but we like to be as up to date as those agencies are as well. Those are great resources. Any other resources you could think of that we need to add at this point in time? Yeah, um, MCN's amazing website. We also have a great COVID-19 webpage, um, which has a lot of printable um, uh, social media resources, easy to change and um, highly editable for anyone who wants to share with their community more about COVID-19. Right, and, and I should point out that the resources for this episode, including a recording of the MCN webinar that Esther and I presented on this topic can be found through the link in the notes section of this episode. Um, so I think at this point in time, I just wanna thank uh, all the podcast listeners. I wanna thank you for joining us today and speaking with Esther on this topic. 
I want to obviously thank Esther for joining me today for this discussion and, and all of her great insight from literally the front lines of what we've been doing at MCN. Uh, and you can reach our staff uh, anytime on our webpage. I want to thank the lis listeners. If there's more expert guidance and tools to improve the quality of COVID care for their vulnerable populations by following our other podcast, On the Move with MCN, and come back and listen to us again. And so, Esther, do you have any closing remarks? I just want to say thank you to you. And again, uh, thank you to the, uh, to all of our listeners, um, whether you're uh, catching us in video on YouTube or uh, finding us on your streaming services. Um, I think this information is in, it's incredibly important. And I'm so happy to be able to do this work, not just with you, Dr. Ed, but with our communities and our partners as well. Well, thank you again, Esther. Great job. And uh, everybody come back for our next podcast. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you very soon. To access resources mentioned in today's podcast, click on the link in our notes section to go to our podcast page at migrantclinician.org backslash podcasts. Visit migrantclinician.org backslash sign up to join our email list and subscribe to our blog to get updates on new MCN podcasts, resources, and webinars. Migrant Clinicians Network is a national nonprofit dedicated to providing practical solutions at the intersection of vulnerability, migration, and health. We offer technical assistance, health provider capacity building, resource development, research and data and evaluation support, and virtual case management for mobile populations, and free resources and training. The information in this podcast is for trained healthcare professional education only. Information should only be used in combination with up-to-date national and international guidelines. The information is not to be used as healthcare advice for the general public.